Hello, you are listening to Pulseway IT Heroes podcast, a show for MSPs and system administrators. Hello and welcome to the um, IT Heroes podcast. And today we got Andy Elwood, uh, the VP of Product Marketing at Pulseway. So welcome, Andy. And if you can do a little introduction to yourself. Uh, hi, Ed. It's uh, great to be here. Yeah, I'm Andy Elwood. I've been kicking around the IT industry for about 35 years. Um, so I've uh, worked with a, a wide range of companies, big to small, um, and I've, you know, as I say, I've been around the, been around the block a, a, a few times. And uh, so glad to have you here, Pulsewin, on this podcast. Uh, so I guess we'll start, um, and today's episode is how to kickstart an MSP business, all about developing, sustaining, and running it successfully, uh, something you're quite comfortable with. We deal with quite a number of MSPs internally as customers, a lot of them we talk to. Um, so we have a lot of insight about this. Uh, to kick it off, uh, we're just going to go over some of the news and we call it the flash news. Um, I don't know if you've seen, but there was a healthcare data breach uh, um, to Jim Data, I believe is the name of the company, or is it called Woodify? Woodify Data Breach. Um, and what's your thought on that? Um, ha hackers targeting fitness data um, and the information they're collecting there. Do you think it was targeted or do you think it's just easier to attack a company like uh, Woodify? Well, um, I think probably a combination of both. It's probably easier. And obviously health data is the ultimate sensitive data that hackers want to get after. But there's things like HIPAA that get in the way. Uh, that help protect that sensitive data. And a gym is, um, deals with sensitive personal data. In the few times I've registered with gyms, uh, you know, they ask you your medical history, but there's no, as far as I could tell, sophisticated way of, of, of storing that data. It was a piece of paper on a clipboard. And they, <laughs> and they asked me some questions in, you know, in a room. So, um, so I'd say that uh, it's, I, I guess it was probably a bit more fortuitous than, than planned, but, um, you know, gyms aren't known for their IT savviness um, uh, and the data they have potentially could be quite valuable. Some people might not want people to know what their ailments are that they're in the gym to recover from. Was it, so there's 5,000 gyms worldwide that was using the software, so that 5,000 gyms uh, were hacked yeah. because of this. And I mean, what kind of data, I wonder, you get in terms of health? I mean, it's your past health yeah. issues. And I mean, how many miles you did on the treadmill? So I'm just wondering how useful it would be, whether it was targeted for the data or uh, well, was it I, just for email addresses and passwords, maybe? I think they just, I, 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 know, I know we're moving, to, we're seeing more targeted attacks, but I get a feeling this is just, uh, they found an easy way in. Um, you know, individual gyms themselves aren't going to take security precautions. Um, so goodness knows how they got in, which way they got in. Um, but I think it is actually that that past data, um, that past health data that you're you're sharing. You're sharing stuff that would be on your medical records. Um, and and I think I think there's probably more luck than design in this case. I see that they're also leveraging this to potentially can use the Woodify platform to charge people's credit card on file oh, okay. um, to access that as well. Um, so we're seeing more and more of these types of attacks. Um, yeah, like you it's said, a, this, it's a question of specialization. Uh, yeah. do, do you think these companies take need to take it more seriously? It's, it's not just, um, you know, not just healthcare, for example, but these software companies that provide um, this kind of software, they need to take um security more seriously oh absolutely because it's now a case of uh, when not if uh when it comes to attacks and so people do need to take it seriously but also just like within a, within an organization uh, an individual organization that's being hacked it's the user is the weakest point so if you are sharing uh yeah if you've got someone like woodify then you it could just be a user that's not taking the secure security precautions at, at the end uh, that is actually providing the way in. So uh, it is a question of both the company needing to take uh, take action, take it seriously, and also to just basically train users. And however many stories there are, users don't seem to get the message that it's down to them. 
uh, ultimately um, to, to to stop these things going in. Uh, again, you know, the attacks being successful. What what recommendation will we give to the uh, gym goers who had their data uh, breached? I suppose change their password. Um, uh, yeah, change the passwords. Um, uh, clearly, I've had uh, I've had a message from Google telling me one of my passwords on another account I didn't even know I had uh, was um, uh, had been compromised. So uh, there's more of those things uh, appearing, but. Um, and I guess it's difficult to get that message across because you get so many uh, kind of phishing text messages and emails telling you that your account's been suspended, your password's expired, all these things and mysterious delivery charges and stuff like that. So it's also a question of, of, of getting the users to, you know, just to trust, um, um, to, uh, so they can trust the message to tell them to do something. But it's not just a question of changing the password. Even though I hate this myself, it is a question of, changing the password regularly um and, and also uh, having different passwords for each login that you have and there's a lot of good tools that do that like i use one password you know auto creates a complicated password um and it, every login has a different password um that it's attached to and then to a fan on top of that for your sensitive yeah. emails and everything else you know even if they do get your password you know a lot of people still use the same password for you know all their platforms and it's the same easy password um so normally when they even, even if they get access to this you know for example this um what if i hack and have your password to that that password might be something you use for your personal email address and maybe your business email address so yeah that's uh, that's obviously what they what they're gambling on that they can uh, they can get into more than one place. So yeah, it, it is an important message to get across. But it's so it is it is an equal responsibility between all the users uh, and the actual design of the software. Initially. And the company that hacked this, they probably are just going to sell that data to specialized um, ransomware companies or companies that can buy this data to do something with. Um, as we see, this specialization in that vertical. Um, um, the companies that steal data come then sell the data and companies that buy the data and then yep. companies that produce the software to, to do something with it. So, I mean, everyone kind of plays their own part in it. In it. Um, and lastly, do you think HIPAA should extend um, to fitness industries? I think HIPAA should extend uh, to anywhere that personal health information is stored. Which it was, which I think clearly includes gyms, and it's not just I think, um, and possibly even you know into insurance companies and things like that, because um, at the moment it's, it is seemed to be focused heavily on the healthcare set, settings itself, but you know that that valuable data appears in other places as well, which could be uh, you know, most people don't really care, but there are some people that are sensitive. There are some things that they may be have, uh, have hidden, uh, things they don't want to know because it could impact um, other aspects of their life. So yeah, it should be extended whenever there is, uh, you know, specific uh, personally identifiable data like this of a certain, of a certain kind and things like GDPR have, have separate regulations for how that data is treated and that should be extended um, into, into other areas. And I think, yeah, absolutely not just in the healthcare setting. So moving back away from this, from the flash news, I think we got that pretty covered. Um, going back to the, the MSP business. Um, so what would you say is the difference between a, a regular startup and a startup MSP? Um, well, a, a regular startup um, has time typically to refine its uh, its offering to get its messaging correct, get its positioning correct, you know, and most investors in a startup will actually allow there to be a period of time for, for those fundamentals to be in place. If it's, if it's producing a product, it's actually getting the manufacturing supply chain set up, or if it's a software, uh, you know, it's actually identifying the market and all, all that kind of uh, fundamental stuff. So you can, you know, famously you've seen some of the, um, you know, the big, the big tech tech stocks, took years to become profitable um whereas with um with an msp it, the different difference is they're also going to have a little bit of time to set up but they need they need they have no business without customers 
that it's not something that they can uh, do in an abstract. They can obviously work out what it is they want to offer and make sure people want what they're offering. Um, and, and, and in some cases, in a way that doesn't happen with other startups to a certain extent, um, you could have somebody who's actually uh, left an existing employee, existing MSP, and taken the customer with them. So they could actually have, they could start off with the customer uh, themselves. And, they're, and then they've got a danger then of developing their offering based around what one customer needs. And every customer is unique and maybe nobody else might want it as well. So there's a combination of they don't have the luxury of, a, of, a, of uh, other types of startup in terms of just settling down before they go to the market. They need to get to the market quite quickly. Um, or they could actually already have a customer but not be prepared uh, to uh, cope with everything they need. So they need to service the customer and scale at the same time. So it can be a, a tricky uh, operational thing to get right uh, at the beginning, but I guess uh, that's that's the difference between a, it, it being a, a service type of offering. Yeah, so you're providing a service rather than a product um, or software um, that has or technology that's potential to be worth something um, that you can get investment earlier on. Known you have a patent on the technology and it, it could penetrate that market. With a service, it's something you need to have uh, pro keep providing to maintain the. Um, yeah, well, and, money. yeah, and so with a product, you can actually show the tech. You can actually show a prototype. You can actually uh, show a, a test version. You can, you know, attract attention. But with a with a service model like an MSP, the product is the service you're offering. If you don't have a customer, you're not offering a service. Uh, so yeah, and so therefore, uh, it's also trickier because if you don't have a customer when you're starting out as an MSP. You are you're also selling an intangible. You're selling trust. You're selling something that doesn't actually exist, uh, and that's trickier because most startups will have something, whether it's a, a cup of coffee or a piece of software, whatever it is, they mm -hmm. will have something that they you can see sure. that you're buying. So, so that's the other the other key difference as well. That's you normally see with MSBs. It, it's either a technician that wants to give it a go, or they're already providing some sort of a service to their friends or family or something. Um, but the, yeah, you're, you're kind of working off a relationship. Um, what, what do you do, what's the key points if you're looking to kick off an MSP and you don't have any connections at the moment, um, and you're looking to start fresh? You don't have a client. You know what, what's your go-to strategy? Um, well, I, I guess um, I guess the fundamental thing is you need to uh, if if you're setting up an MSP, you need to you need to identify why you're setting up an MSP. If you don't have any customers, there must be a reason why you're doing it. Um, but also, I think you do need a little bit of an element of market research. Find out, um, and you could look on job sites to find out. You know, is there a shortage of uh, of technology skills in your particular area? So that could be that uh, that's, uh, that businesses might have trouble attracting the right staff that they need. It also could mean that you could have trouble attracting staff uh, further down the line as well. But um, it's it's work out what you're you uh, fundamentally don't overpromise and underdeliver. Uh, so work out what it is you can offer and and see what uh, what's around. Um, maybe you could. It's even though it's, 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 it's a tough one because what you really shouldn't do is focus on a particular vertical because if if something happens to that vertical, as we saw last year in lockdown, uh, retail or hospitality, then you could be impacted in MSP. However, if you do focus on a vertical, um, you could easily get word of mouth or you will get referrals through people who, who, want, who, who kind of... No, that so is that's a tricky balance, but you you need, really need to be comfortable with what you're offering. Do some research to find out, uh, you know, what people um, uh, uh, are currently experiencing. If there's a, if there is actually a need, um, is there any particular sector that you have certain knowledge of? Because if you can just start using the same buzzwords um, as other people, as the, as your customers you immediately have some kind of credibility as well. So, you know, leverage any piece of knowledge you might have to, to, to find your sweet spot. And, and, it, and just going back, and it depends, again, doing the research of the region you're in. Because you yeah. have cities, and especially here in the US, you have cities that focus on a specific vertical in general. Like when, when I look at, say, Cincinnati, you know, a lot of it is manufacturing. 
Um, Nashville is healthcare. Nashville is healthcare, you know, so it's just known that area. And if, if you can, you know, there's, there's a danger in specializing because of what if something happens to that vertical, mm-hmm. but there's also, I, I assume you become an expert in that vertical. Um, and if you do your research and there's a lot of businesses in that vertical, it would make sense to focus on it. Um, so yeah. again, it, it's doing that research background. What's the, you know, what the town, the city you're looking to, or the re- area you're looking to support, what kind of businesses are there? You know, what's some of the challenges? Uh, what are they looking for? What's their um, operations are like? Um, standards, mm-hmm. security practices and everything else. You just need to become an expert um, in that before coming in and start pitching a, a boilerplate offering, I guess. Exactly. Or even even uh, something as simple as uh, joining a chamber of chambers of commerce or some trade body um, to, mm-hmm. to get known and even spend a, spend a few bucks uh, sponsoring a meeting uh, with a, you know, a couple of pizzas or something to try and find out what people are. You know, you can you can find research other ways. But again, if you do that type of thing through a trade body or let's say chamber of commerce, um, you will also get known quickly as well. And you could do some kind of offering for the members of that group. So there are lots of different ways into the market, but it is really a case because there is, you know, a lot of MSPs, uh, a lot of people offering services. Um, it is a question of being creative. And I think at the moment, there's really no one way, one perfect correct way to, to, to do this. And you can be as inventive as you like. Yeah. Uh, so it's for a lot of these MSPs, and this is kind of bringing us to the next, how, you know, they're coming in maybe with no business experience prior to it. Some of them could be just a bean technicians who know how to do the technical aspect, for, but are sometimes struggling to do the business aspect of it. So that, which brings us to the next point is how do you develop the MSP business? How do you ad- identify new clients, expand your offering? So you get a client in the door, you have one client, things are going okay. They're buying the base package um so how do you expand on that how do you cross sell more to that client uh, better services maybe backup services um how do you grow that business how do you look for new clients post that one client's acquisition yeah it, there's it, it's it's actually this is probably the heart it's harder than getting your first customer is actually how to get the second customer and how to uh, do that without impacting the first customer. So you lose them. Um, so you end up uh, with a net gain of zero. Um, I mean, it's it's to, to start with how you can kind of sell more to the same customer, which is a, clearly the cheapest way to sell, is to sell more to the same customer. Um, it is down to relationship and actually how you, um, and how you work and get to know that customer. Uh, then you will quickly, just by talking to... Their, their staff uh, and just getting to know their environment, you will understand, uh, you know, if there are any issues there, you might see some horrendous security practice um, uh, and you could think, oh, God, we'll probably need to probably need to plug this somehow. So there, there are ways you can find out from there. Um, but I think it's ultimately you, what you mustn't do is think, oh, I need another customer. I need to have, I need to hire someone else. I think uh, max out, max out, that all the tools you have, uh, you know, maximize the productivity you can get from those tools. And that will actually give you a bit of space. Um, uh, but getting customer number two, the best way of doing that is word of mouth recommendation. That is absolutely the, the, the best way of, of getting that. So you do a good job for one person, particularly if you're in a certain area, these, these business people, business owners know a lot of other people in the same space or similar spaces. Again, back to those organizations, uh, you know, the business organizations. Um, and that is the, that's the best way. It's the way you can't control, but that word of mouth recommendation uh, is, is uh, a good, uh, you know, is a quick thing, a quick, uh, a, a good solid way of getting another customer. But what you mustn't do fundamentally is overstretch. You mustn't uh, take on another customer, which means you will actually uh, diminish the service to your existing customer. And you can't, mustn't really also promise things you can't deliver, whether it's having the right tool set or having the right skill set. Um, just move with your pace. Don't don't let the customer dictate uh, to force you to do something when you know nothing about backup or whatever it is, or you know nothing about Linux and they have Linux systems. You know you got it because because that's that's just going to be a recipe for disaster. But what you sh- what what you must continue to do is 
provide uh, provide that service that uh, that people um, so they can see. Okay, this is this is this is why I'm paying someone to do this for me. I'm getting this level of service, and it's yeah. We have customers who um, who will look at information from the, the the systems they're monitoring and can then go to the customer and say, look. I can see this is about to happen. This is the third time this month this has happened. I think you need to do this. And that's an additional sell. So even by using the using the the, the data you're getting in the normal day-to-day -day kind of monitoring and management of the system, you can actually find opportunities for other things as well. Yeah, it's it's really understanding that balance of First of all, referrals, you know, you have to offer a good service, somebody to rank. Obviously, if you're offering a bad service, they're not going to go, hey, you know, we have th this company helping us, giving us a terrible service. No one's going to refer you that. We're building that relationship uh, with the owner um, who can refer you to other small business owners um, is critical. So, you know, some of that face-to-face -face time, um, maybe having just... lunch occasionally. Yep. Um, popping into the office you know that's part of it's not it's not just in a background delivering that service but it's also you have to be customer facing you know and keep building that relationship exactly that's the that's one of the kind of almost hidden hidden differences now between the mon the modern msp and the old-fashioned break fix technician is that when something broke and you called someone up you could see them come into your office with a screwdriver and they'd fix it Whereas a lot of stuff that an MSP does, a modern MSP does with modern tools, is hidden. Um, and if they weren't there, things would break. But uh, you know, in my dim, dim and distant past, I've been in support. And you get you know, nobody cares, nobody notices you when things are working well. They only notice you when things break. And then you're in trouble. You get, don't get the praise for when things don't break, but you get you just get the uh, the abuse. When things, when things do broken. break. So it's important yeah. you don't fall into that trap, especially the modern MSP. You, you've got all the tools to, to do stuff remotely and provide a better service than you ever did before because you're preventing things from happening. But that's not noticeable sometimes. So it's very important for you to sh keep showing that value. Um, yeah, be proactive. Proactively warn people pro before problems happen. Proactive, yeah. Um, reports that you can send out to your customer every month detailing all the things that are happening. So they they kind of they, they know what's happening and they know what you're doing. Um, so you balance it with meeting the your your clients. Um, and this is again, this is the difference between a service and you know a software company or a company providing a product. You know, you're providing a service, and part of that is a big part of that is the relationship you have with the clients. Um and you win on that. Um, so that's, I think that covers the, any, anything else? What do you, what, is there any other, other innovative ways the MSP can get new customers apart from just referrals? If they want to get proactive about it, you know, they don't want to wait four or five months, you know, somebody might prefer them. They want to go at it and find it. Yeah, it depends on the, on, on, it depend, really depends on the region you're in and you know, every every region is different. You know, there are there are some places where where people don't really advertise use social media or word of mouth in kind of smaller communities. Um, I mean, one one way you could obviously uh, social media and stuff stuff like that, and um, where people can see you. But again, I think back to the point I made earlier that maybe just being in that being in the place where your customers are likely to be. So whether it is a chamber of commerce or the local. Uh, or pharmaceutical business organization or whatever it is um it, that would be one way and also it could be if you know anybody in um local media particularly in the local radio station for example so if there is if there's news if there's some security uh hack for example that makes mm -hmm. the news which seems to be happening every week this at the moment um uh you know try and get known around the media. And again, there's lots of media outlets now um, where you can you know, get get known as being somebody who could, they could call on to actually speak about things like this. So if there is a hack, if something's happened locally, um, uh, or it could just be there's been flooding locally. And so people people's machines are flooded and, they, and the, the, you know, their businesses can't operate. So just get, you know, get a reputation, get, 
get known by the local media, whether it's print or radio or something like that, or even you probably might find a local podcast or something like that. Um, uh, so that's another way. So just be able to react to the news and actually bring everything back to, yeah, this is a dreadful problem, but if you did this, 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 and this, this, you know, we could, we could always, uh, we could reduce your chances of this happening to you. Um, so I think it, it is a question in the early days of just being visible and finding as many different outlets as possible. Uh, you know, email marketing, social media, it's becoming crowded. So you need to, um, and, and again, people, uh, in a way for an MSP, uh, particularly if you're going to be targeting smaller uh, companies, they might not know that they need one. Um, uh, and mm-hmm. so it's trying to, it's, so it's no point you advertising, hey, I'm an MSP, when people don't know they need one. And it's trying to find a way of, um, of, of, of saying, look, um, this is happening. I, I can fix it. I, I can help you. And so people will just, you know, just, associate your name uh with uh with something you go oh, actually i heard that guy and yeah he might be yeah he, you know I'll talk to him he's like I... an expert in that field you know yeah. You're kind of positioning yourself as the expert in that field and so though I, I i think part of it i agree with it that you know it, some people don't know they need an msp they know that they, they don't even know they need their it looked after um unless something happens you know um oh we had a breach or something okay we should probably take this seriously you know there's companies that that didn't happen to you and it's about raising the awareness of the potential danger um even giving them free consultations you know we'll yeah. review what you have and here's some advice you know um that could be your way in the door to um into that business as well by offering something free like that yeah because i mean i think it's uh uh you know uh, you know, computing is a is a commodity, um, and, uh, and and gener- and you know we don't see any more companies generating their own electricity. They pay someone to do it for them, and IT is now uh, is now like electricity or water. Um, it's it's a it's a commodity, and so why should you be spending your time keeping the fundamental you know plumbing of your business working? Give that rely give that to other people to rely on uh, because uh, if you're trying to do it yourself i mean there's there's also the other the other big reason for having an msp is that if you're a small smallish company you might have one or two people looking after your it and if one of those leaves you could be screwed particularly as you know that you know the, the skill shortage seems to be increasing every day and salaries are uh, uh, kind of jumping. Uh, the average technician in the in the US is it costs about a hundred thousand dollars a year to hire an average technician. Um, so uh, and 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 some businesses can't you know they be they can't afford. It, it doesn't make to- sense, yeah, for them yeah. to you know in terms of their expansion. You often don't see some internal IT until you maybe have you know 40, 50 people. Um, you start thinking about that sort of stuff. Um, um, yeah. it, it doesn't seem like, yeah, it, it's hard to hire. You don't know what the criteria is for it. Um, and you're overly relying on one person, whereas when you hire an MSP... It's a team. Of, of, yeah, one of the things you're paying for is the fact you don't have to worry about there not being a technician the next time your laptop breaks um, mm-hmm. because that's someone else's problem and that's what you're paying for. So there's, so there's lots of ways of you can position your business. That uh, So if you go ahead and say... Yeah, I'm an MSP. People will say, "Okay, great. What's one of those?" But if you say, "Do you need help? Um, are you having trouble finding the right staff? Have you had any uh, any downtime recently?" Um, uh, that's always a uh, you know. That's if, well, you if, know. What are you doing about security? You know, um, probably yeah. nothing. You know? <laughs> Almost certainly you, nothing. Yeah. Did you know this happened last week with a similar company like yours, and they went out of business? You know, so. Um, so it, yeah, you're right. It's it's asking those questions instead of going, "Hey, I'm an MSP. You should know what I do." You know, they might not necessarily know what you do. Um, ask them the difficult questions. You know, what are they doing now? Like, are, are they having issues with IT? Do they have any downtime? Would cost the company money? You know, what are they doing in terms of their security? Like, and you and you see like all sorts of businesses now use MSPs, like dentists. You know, all that records and all the software they yeah. use for scheduling, booking. Oh, holding that data and if somebody hacks into that, steals that information, that, that dentist goes out of business, reputation is damaged. Um, so, and I think everything that's been happening over the last 12 months is 
has been really um, great for MSPs. You know, more co- it's bringing awareness into the IT space and the security and managing your IT, and it's doing the job for MSPs to bring more awareness to the general public about it. So I, you know, I think that's overall going to be very healthy for MSPs over the next couple of years, and I, I don't think that's yeah. see that slowing down. Um, so it brings us to the next point is increasing headcount, you know, um, while still having profit and delivering valuable and training and making sure that person, you know, and, and then the conversation is, should you bring a headcount in? Yes. You know, what is your efficiency mark that you want to get to? You know, how many endpoints can you manage efficiently before things fall off? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I've I've heard numbers, I've heard numbers of around about 150 endpoints per technician. So we know really efficient MSPs can do 300. Um, yeah. we, we, and that's we, more automation you use, right? It, absolutely. So that's it's it's about there may be ways of of achieving more without hiring staff. So don't go to staff as the next thing because you could end up having somebody and then losing the customer you thought you were going to get. What's why you need to hire the staff? If you focus on automation, if you focus on the flexibility uh, of the, of how you can use the tool, if you just work out, you know, be proactive, that saves time. It's quicker to fix things before they become a problem than after they've happened. Um, yeah, use the information you're getting to, 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 uh, to, to, to be able to fix things. Um, and so I think that's, it, it is, some people, it, it is uh, uh, kind of tempting to try and expand, but I think, in the early days when you're down to when you've got one or two customers you're trying to get get more you're going to have to live with a little bump of it being slightly busy for a while and then we can see yeah now i know the sort of person i need um but um, because it's it's that growing it's that difficult balance of growing the business getting more revenue keeping your customers you have happy you mustn't let that service deteriorate um uh, in any way, trying to you know sell more to the same customer, and also try to sell services that you don't actually have to do much. So you know there are there are kind of training uh, products, so which are automated. You spend half an hour setting them up, and then you can charge a, a fee. There are there's you know documentation, there's backup, there's all sorts of additional services that don't require the manpower of sitting there fixing, and understanding why someone's laptop is, isn't running. So there, you know, look for other things you can offer that don't require extra manpower, which could then bring in that re- extra revenue to like to give you that space to be able to to hire. Um, but also, you, what you don't want is to not be able, not be able to take on a customer because you don't have the headcount. So that's why I say you may need a little bump or or, or be stuck in that. You know, it's it's a balance. Obviously, you need to be profitable enough that you can obviously employ someone and still have some. Uh, money on the you know as backup uh, but but i'll see like you see people get stuck in this uh they have a couple of customers um and they're 100 busy just providing a service to those customers that takes up all of their time so they don't have time for a business um, yes you know analyzing the the market building business plans going out meeting new potential customers networking everything else so i mean if you're in that position where you're profitable but your time is 100 taken up by providing services to your existing customers you need to think about how you can use your time as a business owner um, to unless you're not interested obviously in growing your business um, and you're kind of looking to sustain yourself but if you are getting eaten up each day and you don't have time to network and you don't have think time to think about business plans like you, you need you know you need to think of expanding out you know hiring somebody to take that workload off or getting knock services if you you know Mm-hmm. to free up some of your time so that you can actually because you need to allocate time for your business um, um, not just providing that service yeah which i think is is if if the msp is if it's a you know technician that's setting up on their own that's possibly going to be the the biggest culture shock and the biggest change is the fact that i can't just sit here and 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 and, and uh, you know tweak code all day or try to on the, or try to look for the best mm the best tool I do actually have to do horrible things like talk to the accountant, pay my taxes um, and actually, uh, and try and find customers from somewhere. Call car. Yeah. People, yeah, yeah. you know, and there may be, um, you know, there may be uh, depending where you are in the world, you know, small, uh, small business uh, 
uh, operate services and people who support small businesses that can uh, you may find some you know maybe even go going to a um a kind of a, a, a consultant there's lots of consultants that specialize in small businesses uh, to help with the marketing to help with the the the, the awareness generating um yeah and you'd like to you know even just a little bit of publicity here and there however it is as i said reacting to the news or or however um so so that that can be probably the biggest thing to watch out for is that business will get in the way of you doing your job um and you do need to to, to have a way of of being able to, to to manage that without and still have a life um I think I think that's the it's possible, but you might not have a life. And you think, why don't why am I bothering? Because when I work for someone else, at least I could go away on holiday. And, and and suddenly that goes away. So you need to you need to get that balance right at the beginning. Because if you bury yourself in in that type of the, the technical aspect, the stuff you love, um to start with, then you don't give yourself time to breathe and grow the business if you if you don't kind of build that kind of yeah. breathing space in the first place. step back and think where you're heading what your plan is what, what your goals are you know what, what are you trying to achieve in the next couple of years you know um some of those things are important and you know a lot of msbs put that to the side because they're too busy providing an existing service that, to think about growth um so our next point is you know you know how to sustain existing customers and how to retain them i you know this probably should be an easy one but obviously providing that great service yep. showing your value yeah it's it's i think i think the biggest the biggest issue is is showing value it's a bit like you know having an msp if nothing has gone wrong if you haven't been attacked uh your servers are up uh there could be an element particularly if the business has to cut costs um the career you know the resentment we all feel at having to get car insurance it's like well, why am i paying for this or house insurance um and it was, it was like you 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 pay for it because you need it when it's there. Uh, you, you you yeah you 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 need it to be there when you when you need it. Whereas uh, an MSP can be a bit like that. If you're too good at your job, um, people might start going, well, "What are you doing for for the money?" It's back yeah, to, like, if nothing is broken. So what are you doing? Yeah, you exactly. Know, well, things are not broken. So you know, it's not it's not enough just to deliver a great service. You need to be great at communicating the service you deliver. Um, yeah, it, you know, explain it to your customer, um, break it down. Um, you know, don't assume they understand the same technical language that you have. Um, you overly explain what you're doing um, so they get a good understanding. You know, have good good cadence for reports, uh, meetings, on-site meetings you might schedule to go over everything that's happened. You know. Sure, it might take you an extra 30 minutes to build a report and lay out all the projects you've done and everything else, but it's the value in it that just shows exactly you know what it is that you're doing. And if you're too busy to do that and you say so you're still providing a service, they'll go like, okay, well, see, things are working. I don't, we don't know why we're paying you for it uh, because things are working. Um, and can so we over communicate. And can we pay you less? Um, yeah. because it's, you're not doing anything for the money. So this is, again, the earlier point I made about being proactive. If you can actually say, well, I can see that I think you're heading for trouble, and then what you want is them to go, oh, sorry, I said, we'll, we'll risk it. Then they then trouble hits. Then then that's, that's that might make them think the second time around. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there there is, uh, yeah, you have to, again, the average kind of technician is probably going to be somebody who wants to jump up and down about what they do, but you do need that little bit of uh, showmanship as the business owner to say that we've done this because of this, or we did this because if we hadn't done that, this would happen. You'd be down. And do you know, by the way, the average cost of downtime is $5,600 a minute or whatever it is. Um, yeah. You just need to just give everything a value. Um uh, you know, and, and lots of lots of uh, research stuff out that you can slip into presentations uh, about you know, how how long it takes things to go uh, to, to break, how long it takes for them to get back up. Um, you know, the costs of, of these things, and people don't realise they you know they don't realise because we're so used to computers working, and yeah, and everything, everything just magically works, you know. Um, yeah, and you know, a computer is a very complicated beast. Uh, and well, you know what it does, and we're and just trying to talk to 
you say, well, you know, why is it slow? Well, because you've got a process that's a bit. Well, what's, what does that mean? Why have I got so many processes running? I only, I've only, I've only got Word open. And you, no, no, it, it, it's it, there's a lot, of, lot of moving parts which people don't realise because the manufacturers and the industry have made it so simple, um, and that people don't assume things can go wrong. They know what they know when you know when, when there's a crack on the screen. That's about it, and they don't really get why memory is running slow or why why things can't save or you know, why they can't open yeah and then you know one of your applications crashes and your business site is down maybe you have online payments and you're yeah. not getting paid and you know all, all this can escalate you know we're just relying on technology and, and that's just increasing and keeps growing like you know internet of things and all sorts of device devices we're looking at like factories all the equipment is connected to the internet tractors are connected to the internet yeah. because they're self-automated um, um every cars are connected to the internet like and, and as we progress all all sorts of devices are going to be connected to the internet and if one of them crashes or something goes wrong that's going to be downtime for your business your, your team's not going to be operational etc etc and yeah you know, and if you are targeting the small business uh, as an as an MSP, you're, you're going to offer services to small businesses. They are the ones that are more likely to rely on externally hosted services, and mm-hmm. so they might go, well, "Why do I need you? Because you're not running this." But you you but they will be integrated. With what we you know there'll be integrations going on. There'll be connections going on. There'll be security issues. There's all sorts of stuff, and so they're more at risk, in fact, because they don't have the knowledge. They've just bought these. They've listened. To, they've seen the adverts, and they go, oh, "I'll have one of those to, to, to run my accounts. I'll have one of those. Thank you very much. I'll do this." And then suddenly, somebody changes something somewhere, and the connection and the integration doesn't work anymore. So uh, it is a continual education. I think as an MSP, you can't assume your customer knows what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what would be the consequences of you not doing it at all. And so I think there is uh, certainly in the early days. While you're building up that trust, there will be a large amount of uh, of that type of education, and then there will be a period when it will flip, and they will trust you, um, and that's uh, and, and that's the point you want to aim at, and that's and when when you got to that level, then you're you could be fairly happy with that customer. Uh, make sure you understand what their plans are as well, because they might be planning massive growth, and and if you've got a good re- relationship, they might want you to work with them, but they will. You know, no one's particularly loyal. Um, if if you can't support them as they grow, they will have to look somewhere else. So, you know, try and get some some uh, future detail about what they're what they're after, so you you've got plans in place should you need them as well. So, so it's yeah, you know, having that relationship and keeping the customer, it can be a double edged sword. It's like almost like you're an employee of the organization, <laughs> where you where you work with them to define their growth, and you're you're part of that stack if they're making decisions that. You know, you can advise and set projects in place. Yeah. Yeah, you, I, that's, that's where you want to be. And I, I think another point that you made on the small businesses is, you know, small businesses also don't have the capital to back themselves if something goes wrong. Um, you know, we you know see downtime in a bigger business. You know, they can sustain themselves a little bit. You now, with small businesses, it can be dangerous. Um, you know, how long can you be down for? Uh, how long, how much cost can you absorb what happens if you have to pay a ransom fee you know mm-hmm. um it can put you out of business um so you know it's more critical for small businesses that something doesn't go wrong yes absolutely i have seen i did see something a couple of weeks ago about there's uh, i cannot remember the number unfortunately but there's some big number of companies that have a ransomware attack that go out of business it's it's over 50 percent, i think that that you can you can be uh, badly impacted and people don't realize the long-term uh, impact uh, of that. You know, it's like, you know, you see, you know, when banks, people can't get paid, they can't get access to their money for a week. Uh, you hear about the big stories and that, that clearly has an impact, but banks are big enough. They can cope with that. They can cope with losing a few hundred yeah. thousand customers. Whereas, you know, a small business, the same thing happens and you go, well, no, I want to do this. Or if you say, if it's a retail site and you can't, you suddenly have, no um no sales over a period of time and you might not even notice with that type of thing as well or if you're offering some kind of service 
uh, and people can't access it, then you know, why am I paying you? Uh, and it, it can get it can get really messy. So what what the small, particularly the small business wants from an MSP, they obviously want a service. They want their IT to be up and working, but they actually want an advisor. They you know they 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 need help. Um, and so you shouldn't just be there, position yourself as providing a service. You're there as the expert who can guide them and help them choose the next piece of software to help them uh, to say, well, actually, did you know you could actually do this if you did this? Uh, and that's what they want. And, and that's the great position to be in. Aim to be, aim to be a trusted advisor. And then, and then you then have to prove yourself less. Um, and that frees up a bit of time because they just they just now have now realized you did something, you fixed the problem, you stopped a problem from happening, or whatever it is, and they and they and you get trust. That'll take a time, you know, that'll take a year or so. Um, if things go well, but it'll be worth it in the end. And that, that comes again full circle, you know, if it takes time and you, and you are a consultant, you are there to advise them. Um, it's going to be easier for you to, if you make a su suggestion in 12 months saying, okay, I think we need to upgrade and introduce, you know, disaster recovery backup. Um, you know, they're going to trust you on it because yeah. you've proven yourself over the last 12 months that, you know, that you are the consultant, you're advising them and, and the things that you've advised have worked out. Um, so as you keep building that, you're not rushing it. You build that trust that the next time you suggest something that you think you feel they need to do regarding their, infrastructure you know they're going to trust you on that yeah absolutely and also i you know you mustn't forget the end user as well so one hand it's you know the, the business owner that's very key but they will if if the end user is feeling that they're it's taking a long time for any issue they have to be addressed you know that will get fed back to the business owner who will get fed back to you and so you, yeah. you've got to work up both levels work at the end user level keep them happy as well as the the person who's paying your bill. Absolutely. Um, so last point here is how do you identify the right tools uh, for your business as an MSP? Um, well, I guess it's it, it's back down to what it is you want to offer, um, but what you want as a certain well, vertical you're focusing on. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, uh, because you might want some compliance stuff if it's in a, a heavily regulated area. Um, but but fundamentally, what you want are tools that will uh, that actually prevent you, <laughs> that actually save you work as opposed to creating work. So you want something that's easy to use, easy to understand. You don't have time to spend you know, a month learning how to use something. You've got to be, it's got to be fairly intuitive. Uh, you also want something that's... Um, that, that actually has a, a large amount of automation. So you can actually spend time um, at, at the start setting it all up. And so you, to save time operationally down the line, which then frees you up to find other customers, the more you can automate, uh, the more flexible you can actually use. You, you don't want something you're tied to one terminal in an office. You want to be able to access it from, from anywhere, wherever you are. I, I always hear this, um, you know, I'm too busy to automate. Yeah, I've yeah, I've I've heard that as well. And that's um and the other advantage of automation is you if you're if you're automating uh, uh scripts, if you're creating scripts uh or workflows or things like that, what you're doing is you're you are kind of embodying best practice. And that again helps with the the potential headcount issue later on. If you've if you've basically just recreated the best way of fixing most problems and you have those ready, ready built and ideally if the solution will actually can automatically trigger these these things as well if something goes wrong if there's an alert and something goes wrong um you, you want a tool that makes you basically want a tool that does two things makes you efficient and actually makes you look good um and if you can um yeah that, that's really the thing you're looking for you want to you want to be able to save time and you also want to be able to offer a great service get all the information you need simply and one that um, isn't going to cost uh, extra if you expand. Obviously, if you have more endpoints, you'll have to pay more typically. Um, but if, if you try to do other services, um, 
you don't want to have additional hidden charges. Try something that's kind of fairly open so you understand what it is and you work out how much to charge your customer. So something that you can still make money on um, by, uh, and so that if you had a tool that was so ex too expensive, it would be, uh, by the time you've added the margin you need to have to pay your bills, to pay uh, any members of your team, um, it could price us off out of uh, out of the potential customer. So you need so pricing has to be because uh, you don't want to do it for for just a few cents. You need to be able to make reasonable money, and there's lots of ways of you know lots of information around how best to price services. But I think that's a key thing. You need to have a tool that will allow you to price services that allow you to grow and be successful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so we've got to the end of it now. So to summarize some of the points we've talked about, if you could summarize it in a couple of sentences. Um, well, I think, so um, MSPs are, are nothing without their customers, whereas, you know, a, 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 another startup business can still be something without any customers. MSP fundamentally desire, uh, is based on the, uh, on the customer. So it, 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 you know, it's their kind of, um, almost their identity is, is what their customer base is or who they are, um, it's very easy to get overworked and overwhelmed very quickly. You need to uh, find the right tools that allow you to offer the sort of service you want to offer. Uh, you need to value add your services. So, so prove your worth to your customer. Um, uh, educate, particularly in the first year or so, educate uh, and make sure um, make sure you can deliver. If you, when you've created your uh, SLAs, your service level agreement, make sure it's stuff you can actually deliver. Um, it and it's profitable. You know? Yeah, absolutely be uh, profitable. It's very tempting to cut cut money, cut, you know, cut it, costs. Cut it's, the it's a bit more, especially in this, you know, be providing a service. It's a bit more challenging to have a better profit margin than you're providing a product or a, or a software. You know, um, yeah, there's a lot more things at play that you need to watch out for. But All having your costs control. And time, yeah, having control and having a, an overview of the situation and, again, having a, a tool that allows you to work really, really efficiently um, that can actually save you from hiring extra staff, um, uh, you know, just max max the, uh, the the productivity elements of the tool um, and that can help you. But, yeah, you absolutely have to you, – you, you've got to do business despite the fact you might not want to do the business side of the business. You have to do that. You have to spend time on that. It'll get easier as you go on, but you know, work. Uh, don't over promise and under deliver. Under promise and over deliver, ideally, um, uh, mm -hmm. and get that good reputation because that reputation will mean you will keep your customers and you'll be recommended to other people. And word of mouth is the best form of recommendation. You can only do that by offering a service that that people really appreciate and they understand the value of but you also still need to make money. And communicate like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you tell them what you do and set up a good cadence for that. Um, you know, be structured about it. Every month I need to send an email to my customer. This is the day of the month I need to do it and have a good cadence for that and watch your delivery, watch your communicating. Yeah, um, and don't, uh, yeah. And when you're, uh, particularly if it's a, a small customer's never had an MSP or anybody doing a service thing. When, when you try to sell, don't sell on the technology you're using. Don't tell, don't sell on um, your, your skills or anything. Just, just sell on the benefit. Sell on, you know, why? You know, there, there's a big problem. You know, did you know that so many people have been, uh, have had a ransomware attack this, this year? Do you know uh, how much it costs if a system is down? Do you know how long it takes to get some, to get your concentration back when, when something's crashed? Mm -hmm. uh, just use that type of thing to actually show the show the um the, you know the things that they probably haven't even thought of, and they'll go, oh, this person knows this stuff, and oh, okay, maybe, uh, and then that will get you in the door. They won't speak the same language as you. They they want the business to carry on. They want continuity. They want happy users. They want a profitable business. And if you can help them do that. That you know, that's really good. They don't 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 necessarily want to talk technical, particularly if they're a small business. Larger businesses will want to understand your credentials a bit more, but it's actually all about the value you offer. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Andy. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll see you on the next one. Okay. Bye-bye.